I want to introduce our first speaker for this entire course. Very excited to have her, Dr. Julia Lopez from the Washington, from Washington University School of Medicine. So there's actually a more, just like uh, probably a couple weeks ago, a um, publication out from the Annals of uh, Epidemiology that talked specific to Latin population and the disproportionate effects of COVID. And so some of the things that we know, you know, is that generally speaking, Latin X population is 18% of the US population. So that's just kind of the general statistic, right? Among confirmed COVID cases, which we know is like not the whole, you know, picture, of course, Latinx make up 33% of those cases. Um, and so, and that's a confirmed, and then also that we know who, what race or ethnicity they picked, right? Because there's actually not, we all know that there's actually about 50% of COVID cases that the information about their race and ethnicity has not been clarified. So, you know, this is all dependent on, this is all related to what we know or what's been confirmed. Um, you know, when we talk about hospitalization rates, Latinx and non-Latinx Black persons are four, four to five times more likely to be hospitalized than the non-Latinx white persons um, for COVID-related specific reasons. Um, one in five confirmed COVID cases, um, death-related cases, are among Latinx individuals. So we're talking a lot about disproportion, and then we're talking about, well, why is that, right? And that kind of goes back to your question, Krista, like, why is it that we're having such a seeing these things? And are we really so shocked people who've worked in health disparities or racial disparities kind of work? No, unfortunately, I mean, we're not, right? But that we're seeing it to such, to such a, a extreme or to a dynamic really does highlight the level of structural racism, structural inequities that are in place that really make these numbers the way that they are and currently trending. Um, so what do these kinds of things look like? First and foremost, um, you know, when we think about what are kind, what the types of work we're, th we're thinking about as it relates to Latin folks, and especially Latin immigrants, both documented and undocumented. In the Midwest, the proportion of those who have been infected and who have confirmed cases is higher than just the general proportion of those who are held in the Midwest, which the Midwest is considered like Iowa, Missouri, Kansas, North Dakota, South Dakota, like the, the uh, CDC actually has a map where it decides like what is Midwest, Northeast, et cetera. So you could look that up if you wanted to just get an idea. But what do we know about, you know, kind of what sits in the Midwest is there's going to be large poultry meat packing industries who hold you know a lot of those jobs it is the latin immigrants who do and so what's happening is that it, depending on the job that you have and because the presidential um, administration had meat packing and poultry and all of that as essential workers right here we are now with a really you know impacted population who is also you know who are also a large proportion of those who are working in those industries and so you have that culmination of, well, this is where I already work. This is where I'm at. And then there's also a pandemic happening. But if I'm going home and I'm an undocumented immigrant, I also don't have access to the same health care as I would somebody else. So we even have to think about disparities, even as it relates to those who are documented versus undocumented. I, as a first generation immigrant, have privileges as a documented person that, you know, my family, you know, over here doesn't. And so what does that do as it relates to illness, progression of illness? We know that people who don't have access, who don't have the funds to do so, are going to wait a lot longer, become really sick until they can't move. And so they're going to go in and get help then. But is that progression gone too far, right? And probably so in a lot of situations, unfortunately. So we're talking not only, you know, what are you already in, you know, experiencing as your just personal health, but what are the structures in place? If I'm working in a place that also is not, um, you know, that's really hard to do social distancing in, like a meatpacking place, that's not like many people I have had conversations with who've worked in such industries talk about, like, it's very close. Everything is very close. Everything is closed, right? You don't have a lot of like movement. And so what's the likelihood of getting infect infected there? You have also the sheer access 
of health insurance, who is capable of getting the health insurance and who's not, then you have to think about, well, what's available around the area? If people are living in more rural areas, how is that going to impact their ability to get those services, right? And then you think, well, then it's like, well, there may be something there, but they don't have a Spanish speaking, you know, uh, person there, or they don't have translation services readily available. It takes a few days. A few days makes a big difference for someone. If you're trying to engage someone in care, and this is very much an HIV standpoint, because I do a lot of work in HIV, is like, you want to do the engagement then. Somebody says, I'm interested, you need to do that engagement right then, because loss to follow up is so, so high. It's the same perspective here. Loss to follow up is going to be high because people have other kinds of impacts that they're gonna have to deal with. What am I gonna do with my family? I have to go back to work. How are we gonna pay those bills? You know, like, and thinking I can't be here waiting for someone to help me with my health when I, there's very large implications if I don't go back to work. So one of the things I think um, is going to be really imperative is understanding implicit bias. Um, and, you know, implicit bias is everywhere. Uh, even someone like myself who teaches like an anti-oppression course on all the isms, like we all have them in, in an implicit bias, something that we react to because social, you know, how we grow up in our, in our place, wherever that was, the dynamics of our family, the dynamics of our social systems has decided that this person who represents this equates to that, right? This kind of understanding of, um, you know, when you see like a Latin person, you know, uh, you know, you think, oh, they're taking away my job, right? This kind of connection that doesn't have really any underpinning, like that, that that's not actually show, like doesn't shake out in statistics, doesn't shake out in economics, rather, the reason why we have, you know, the robust agriculture that we have is because of the backs and the hard work of immigrants, specifically, mo and most of them being from Central and South America and Mexico, right? And so when we're thinking about, you know, what we're saying is in being able to pay attention to how much that's going to influence who we see, how we see them, and therefore what kinds of policies we're going to make out of them. I teach this policy class and I say, for every policy that's made, it always starts with the individualistic lens because the US and the development of these policies comes from individualism. And that in of itself is a problem because if we see it only as this only going to be impacting us or how it can put us forward, then you know inherently we're causing even more of a disproportion um, in the work of others. And so I think implicit bias is an important factor. I think an active movement to say diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? It's not enough to say we're looking for diverse persons. I don't know what you mean by that. Like, like who you mean by you say diverse? Most of the time people equate diverse to race, which is fine, like, but diverse, Diversity also includes lots of other things. So, okay, so we're talking race, ethnicity, we're talking about, what else are we talking about here? Gender, sexual orientation, you know, we're we talking about ableism, right? Like, what are we talking about when we're saying diverse? And is that really enough? No, inclusion is that second part. Cultural humility, not cultural competence, not that I know that you, you know, speak Spanish and that's as far as I need to know, but rather that I am forever ongoing learning something about a person's culture through the work that I do. And that plays a role not only in healthcare, which is where I do a lot of my work in, but it does play a role in local government. If we do not make note about what it is to be diverse and inclusive, and then to also see that representative in the policies that are being made, then you know we're really going to be missing out a whole ton and it's not going to change anything.